Hey, good evening. Uh, welcome. Thanks for coming out. Um, I, uh, I promised um, Ben Prosky that I wouldn't sound uh, too happy about the fact this is our, our final landscape event of 11-12. It's been an amazing series. It's also been the first series that Ben really got his hands around and helped shape. And as a result, it's actually the first series that I feel quite proud of in the time that I've been here in terms of its depth and breadth and, and range of, uh, of subject matter. Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to uh, welcome and introduce for you uh, Ben Aranda. Uh, you, you know um, Ben Aranda um, and, and his work uh, through the partnership Aranda Lash. Um, beginning al almost a decade ago now, um, Aranda Lash have been uh, pursuing really an extraordinary line of work, um, highly experimental, provocative, and I think uh, highly uh, stimulating, uh, from a range of scales, from uh, furniture, uh, through installations and interior environments, uh, through, through buildings, and increasingly uh, landscapes and larger territorial scaled uh, questions. Uh, you will have uh, seen their work in the pamphlet architecture number uh, 27 on tooling. Um, you, you also will have seen um, among the honors and awards and recognition they've received their uh, Young Architects Award uh, a couple of years ago. Their work has been uh, acquired in a variety of interesting collections, uh, featured in various Biennale and a range of uh, cultural venues that connect architecture with the arts. Uh, for, for, for my own purposes, I've been um, following Ben's work for, for some time now and have been interested in it, um, in, in, in particular given um, its uh, engagement with uh, computational methods and the discourse around computation in, uh, in architecture as it looks to uh, models of um, emergence from the, na the natural world. Um, there's a, increasingly, in, in my mind, a, a, a need for those of us on the landscape side to be uh, conversant in that discourse. Um, and I do think that there is an interesting uh, point of convergence, or maybe point of tangency at least, um, that's increasingly productive these days between um, those on the kind of uh, architectural and, and, and digital flank looking at uh, properties associated with the natural world on the one hand and those of us on the landscape side looking at models from nature uh, on the other. I, I sort of, I joke that a few years ago I think we realized that we're all reading Darcy Thompson but for different reasons. Um, in, in that regard I've been interested to find um, uh, Ben's work working uh, across uh, various models of ecology, um, and it was in that space that I was very pleased that he agreed to come and as a visiting faculty member teach a uh, studio on uh, Gabon, uh, this term here. Um, I don't know how many of you were here for uh, Christophe Giraud's talk on the weekend and his um, Eteha Zurich technology, the point cloud captured digital model of that Swiss uh, mountain valley. What I told Christoph was it was really, I think, an important line of thought and that um, uh, ben, ben had a, a 3D scan of the entire country <laughs> and I'd be happy to meet him halfway. Um, it's uh, a great pleasure to welcome Ben Aranda. Thank you, Charles. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, giving the lecture and also uh, teaching has been really uh, fun here. We just got back from from Gabon, Africa, a few days ago, with the uh, with the students, and um, can really honestly say that we had a we had a great time. And um, Harvard students uh, really conduct themselves um, um, in a in an amazing way. I mean, uh, we had the students in front of um, government officials and um, heads of some very important companies doing work there and had some amazing discussions and I was really um, just very proud to be in their company. So it's a real, real pleasure to be here. Um, what I'm going to do is talk to you about um, a few projects in our practice and try and describe uh, some tendencies that we have. Um, when people ask us if we're, um, if we're artists or architects or designers, uh, we always say that we are architects and that every project that we do, we, we look for architecture. We try and find it, whether it's a, uh, an object or a piece of furniture, a wall, uh, a structure. But I think the, the way in which we go about doing it, the way in which we try and find architecture, um, has to do with this influence of, of computation. 
But the way we see computation is something that's highly destructive in a way. It has a tendency to break things down. I mean, that's what computation does. It breaks things down into parts and language, and it allows you to, to rebuild them. And this idea of uh, something having a kind of re recuperation or a recuperative quality is, is what is the backbone of our, of our work. It's why we're interested in modularity. It's why we're interested in building things out of small parts. And so when I say uh, the, the word computation, um, just imagine these little piles of sand. The most important thing for us about these piles is that, uh, is that they're always given a kind of second life. Uh, or multiple lives that you can you can you can you can imbue them with this intelligence, with this ability to speak and to reform. And this is something that we've learned from uh, from from many things, from looking at models in in the natural world. Um, the snowflakes are a big influence for us, and especially uh, the practitioners of certain kinds of uh, of experiments. This is Wilson Bentley. He's one of our heroes. He photographed all these snowflakes that I just showed. He photographed in his lifetime um, almost 6,000 snowflakes using, uh, using the tools that he had at hand. He was a farmer in Vermont. And until Wilson Bentley photographed these 6,000 snowflakes, no one was really sure that no two snowflakes are alike. But his, his methodology and his you know, inexhaustive uh, 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 um, catalog kind of proved this, and it, and it showed us that through through very um, humble means, you can make uh, you can make very um, very fundamental observations about the world around you. Uh, when we were asked to do, do something at the MoMA, uh, we were invited by Palantinelli to do something that involves scale. That's all she asked us to do. She's the uh, curator there, and we worked with this material scientist in that photograph. And material scientists are at the um, at the edge of a of a, of a new kind of um, of a new age uh, today. When we first approached uh, Matthew Scullin, is his name, with this idea of a collaboration, and we talked to him about these ideas of computation and about uh, information and self-assembly and modularity. His his and we asked him, let's take on just this idea of scale. He said something really. Um, uh, really exciting to us. He said, you know, civilizations are usually described um, in the way, uh, in the materials and the methods of production that they use. So, for instance, we had the, um, we had the Bronze Age, we had uh, the Steam Age, we had, uh, very recently we're coming out of the Silicon Age, and he said that the next age that we're going into is the age of the nano. So, for us, this collaboration was really about this idea of self-assembly and producing a kind of, um, um, oops, uh, producing a um, uh, producing a model basically for understanding how um, how molecules uh, assemble, grow, and build structures. And in the end, we were able to build a kind of working algorithm uh, that. Uh, that modeled basically the way that the material scientist grows materials. But in the end, we decided that, well, let's just make a wall, and that wall can be uh, many things. It can be uh, simply a relief, although a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the discussions we had with other people in the exhibition, uh, people intuited kind of other things into what was made. They asked us, you know, what is this city you've made, or is this, a, is this a compound or some kind of community? And for us, it was really none of these things. What we were really out to do, and I think it's something that, you, that has happened if, in, a, in a few projects in our practice, is that when you, deal with, when you deal with systems of scale and when you deal with, uh, let's say, growing and uh, programming modularity, uh, what you're really dealing with is information itself, and that's something that carries through uh, in all of our projects. So even um, hmm. Let's see this here. Sorry about that. So even when it comes down to, uh, say, a very simple skin on a building, 
uh, using these same properties to to look at, say, openings and erosions and ways of uh, letting people in and out, uh, we transported that same, um, that same technique to explore this. And inside this structure, this was uh, Design Miami in 2000, uh, 2009. Um, we, we had a, a small exhibition of our work. And um, one, uh, one project that maybe precipitated, uh, and it's worth kind of talking about uh, for a little bit, is, uh, is, is, is it's called the Grotto. It was a um, competition for PS1 in 2006, and it was the first time that we um, that we explored uh, orders that you could call uh, wild. It was uh, an exploration of um, of a landscape type, the the Grotto, but using um, basically a uh, 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 a construction process that would uh, that would involve only uh, only four types of shapes, let's say boulders cut out of styrofoam, and uh, and pieced together in, in a way that it would self-assemble. So through a uh, through a limited set of types, you're able to get a kind of um, a sort of unfolding, almost infinite variation of of structure. Now the I think what what really we garnered out of this project was not that everything needs to be, let's say, uh, computational, but that computation allows you to um, to take some models from history and allows you to use historical types as a kind of uh, inspiration, so that things can always be read and and reread uh, using these techniques, so that history itself is a kind of um, is a is a is a grab bag of opportunities. Uh, so here you can see just the kind of quick um, uh, explanation of the process of moving from one kind of modularity uh, through to another, and then looking for opportunities of how you might uh, occupy that space. Now the same uh, the same idea. Well, we've carried out over the years uh, in producing furniture. Uh, the furniture is uh, extremely, uh, you know, uh, uh, extremely, let's say, intense to produce. But the the idea of exploring this kind of wild property uh, became an obsession for us. And the the way to describe this sort of wildness or this is it's uh, it's an aperiodic assembly. And that's what the grotto, that's what these pieces of furniture are about. They explore something at the edge of, um, uh, of material science now. Uh, in fact, um, uh, the recent Nobel Prize recipient uh, was, um, uh, was awarded his, uh, for his research in quasi-crystals. And what you're looking at here, these are basically the, uh, the known crystal structures for how solid materials organize themselves, things like metals, diamonds, um, anything non-organic. Uh, and it's quite uh, in amazing to us that with all the complexity in our universe, you can narrow it down to just a few simple kinds of structure, a few different kinds of molecular lattices. And they're all periodic. They, they fill out space endlessly. But there's been this... Um, there was always this interest, uh, and it came up over uh, many centuries. Uh, on the right there, you're looking at a, uh, a nave of a mosque in Iran, uh, 15th century. Uh, and then the left, you have a drawing by Kepler, uh, 16th century. And what they're looking at here um, is how to use modularity in a way where aperiodic systems are produced out of it. So you have, you take a simple shape and you start repeating it and it makes these, um, these little holes. And Kepler was fascinated because while you can produce these holes, let's say, predictably, the, the, the holes would start to collide 
and they would collide in a way that was not very predictable. And this is the, the, the kernel of aperiodicity, a uh, where you have local symmetries but, and local repetition, but, uh, but globally it's non-repetitive. And it implies that there's a kind of infinite possibility, and infin infinity comes out of so, uh, uh, a small set of parts. And you can imagine, um, this, was, this was, to date, we know, is the earliest discovery of this kind of infinity, and how this idea of infinity relates to something spiritual is really interesting. Kepler, when he saw these fused decagons, remarked how frightening they were, and he called them monsters. Uh, flash forward 1984, quasicrystals are produced in a lab. And f for us in the office, we were stunned that some of the wildest things you could possibly imagine, while they might not exist yet, the story of the quasicrystals shows us that maybe someday they will or they can. So, Inspired by this, we've, you know, we've sort of taught ourselves and learned how to make these things. Um, here, this is a, uh, a simple table made out of walnut. Uh, it uses two kinds of shapes. Um, with, with, some, with the help of some kind of automation, we're able to produce these um, and, uh, and just explore the possibilities for expression in these objects. The other thing that uh, the quasi-crystals gave us um, was a kind of endless uh, variety of, let's say, roughness. Um, we were asked to do something at the Venice Biennale uh, for the last one in architecture, and we decided to make our own quasi-crystal. Um, and what it does is, uh, what we wanted to introduce was this idea of scale in the, in the, in the aperiodicity. So introducing a kind of way that the quasi-crystal can become a fractal. And uh, what's always great about exploring these forms of modularity is that you can take a solid block of foam and you can put it on a wire cutter and with one line, this little red line here, zigzagging up and down and then you rotate the block 9 degrees and you take that same line and do it again, what you're able to get is a, um, is a solid block uh, filled with um, filled with these quasi-crystal components, filled with these modular, uh, irrational little blocks. So we made these of many sizes and then engaged in this really uh, kind of highly, in, uh, I would say at, at some moments, very intuitive uh, process of, um, of, of piecing them together. Um, we, we've built a kind of automated um, algorithmic like generator of these shapes that we can get out of it. But when it comes time to building, um, so much of the kind of fun happens in the, in the discovery of the, of the process. So um, we weren't sure really how, what we were going to end up with, but we knew how to kind of engage the process. Um, so these are all made out of foam, and then they're finished with this uh, truck bed liner. So it's, um, uh, it's a finish that, that you usually use to line the kind of uh, the backs of uh, trucks. It's like highly uh, durable stair treads too. And it, um, two years ago, it came out in white. So we thought it'd be a great, uh, uh, a, a great thing to use. Um, so out of the process, you know, you go in and you're like, all right, I'm going to make all these. Um, but in the end, we ended up with these. So, uh, and, and we started to catalog them. Okay, what, some you can, you can sit in in a certain way, some you can do this or do that. Um, and they all had their own kind of eccentricities and their own ways of, of, of organizing uh, sort of use, occupation, potentially a space. Um, this is, I'm going to turn the sound off here because it's really, um, I should uh, say this is a video that was produced by the, um, by Fendi, the, the sponsor of the organization. So um, that's why you might see us popping up uh, every now and again. Um, but the idea here in Venice was just to produce a, um, a, we called it a landscape installation, so something that informally uh, allows people to gather and use uh, in their own way. Um, when we, uh, just as a kind of little side note, when we came back to collect the pieces, um, 
they were very used, some of them beyond the point of um, uh, rescue, but they were also a lot of them like upside down. Some of them were you know, like a uh, quarter mile away. Um, and we found that people basically uh, would just pick them up, flip them any which way and figure out their own use out of it. So there was a real, um, uh, almost like a kind of very um, uh, laissez-faire kind of attitude about how they would be used. Um, but the, the idea behind um, you, do, you know, producing this work that is systemic and modular, um, capable of kind of multiple expressions and this kind of uh, wildness, um, what we're looking for is that um, when we decide to make them, like when they go through the lens of construction, that there's a, that the, you're allowed as a designer to be quite intuitive with them. So it's this process of, of, of being intuitive that, that kind of makes it really, um, uh, makes it fun, but also allows you to kind of internalize the, uh, the, the properties of the system, if you will. Uh, that's when it really becomes a kind of playing field and when it gets, um, um, when it gets interesting. Uh, they also, uh, we're able to, uh, let's say, uh, invite some friends and have these kind of informal conversation series uh, using these objects. So there was this idea that we could start to program some context uh, around the installation itself. So it wasn't just a bunch of things, but that these things would, um, would, uh, would produce these kind of conversations. Um, so we were asked um, uh, by, by this, our sponsor, Fendi, uh, collaborator and sponsor, to, uh, to do it again um, at, a, at an art fair at, at Design Miami. But this time, um, what, we, what we did is we wanted to uh, put this idea of performance on the table or really put the, uh, again, this video is by, by the sponsoring organization as well, um, but really talk about what it means to, to make these things. So, uh, so what we did is we just started with a wall of, uh, of these units. And then uh, through the course of the installation, we would, we would build pieces. And we would have people uh, design, uh, design their own aggregations using this, uh, using this iPad uh, app that we built. And so they would, uh, they would design their own, and then, um, and then we would build them right there, um, right there in, uh, in the fair. Uh, we, we would try and edit them down so they would be, you know, actually uh, very uh, buildable, but, um, but we were able to accomplish this through, through the tools that we had and the, you know, and the glues. The glues are actually very vital to this project. Uh, the glues and the finishes all come from the automotive uh, space. And um, I have to say there are some incredible glues out there uh, that are permanent and dry within five seconds. So if anybody needs to know that, uh, I can give you that product number. Um, we were also, um, uh, well, we made a, a Fendi bag and uh, some, other, um, uh, uh, some other objects that, uh, that were really about collaborating with, uh, with their craft so that we could, we could begin to uh, understand their, their method of fabrication and their own tools with the tools that we had. So here you can see the wall kind of um, eroding and more objects uh, kind of being produced uh, as time went on. So at the end of it, we had, you know, we had a catalog of like maybe 40 or 50 pieces um, that um, um, a lot of them were, were, were very new. Uh, this is just an, uh, this is the iPad app um, that was that was made for the show. It's very simple, and it's uh, it really kind of encapsulates the uh, this this idea of um, this crystalline modularity. Um, uh, basically, you click on a point in this infinite lattice, and uh, and the crystal structures grow there in a fractal way. They kind of grow towards those those points. Um, hot on the heels of that project, or actually simultaneously, we were asked to, uh, to produce um, a proposal uh, installation for, uh, for Central Park. And 
uh, we decided to explore uh, the same method of aggregation uh, as a landscape motif. Uh, one of the amazing things about Central Park, I mean, um, there are a lot of amazing things about Central Park. One of the amazing things about it are really the bridges um, that, uh, that the park uh, has, and the bridges that allow for, as you all know, uh, many different types of occupation to occur. So vehicles and pedestrians, you can start to uh, you know, combine and, uh, and layer these things. And that was a real innovation in the park. So our idea was, well, let's make, uh, let's make our own set of bridges that will connect um, certain parts of the park uh, that are otherwise unconnected. So going over, um, uh, over uh, certain uh, crossways or rivers, um, maybe, um, uh, stepping stones, uh, bridges, some bridges that went to nowhere. Um, and the idea was to really start to control this building process and start to scale, scale it up in a way, slowly, but uh, get, it, get it out of the scale that it was at uh, previously. Uh, the next project I'm going to show also deals with um, this kind of scalar property. But uh, this, is a, this is a model uh, here. It's a model of the Morning Line, which is a project we have been working with Ma uh, the artist Matthew Ritchie for the better part of, I'd say, five years now. And it's, uh, the project still continues, still has a life. And what you're looking at is a drawing. It's a, it's a drawing in space. It's made up of all of these, um, of all of these components that connect together and uh, become a, a drawing that tells a story. And the story that it tells is specific to Matthew Ritchie's pro uh, project as an artist. It's a story that combines all, uh, let's say, all the symbols uh, of, of both cosmological narrative and, um, and scientific symbology into this kind of complex web of, of, uh, of, of narratives and ultimately it becomes just a, a kind of tool for him to draw. And so what we said is like, well, why don't we take your drawing technique and draw on a shape and then test that shape structurally. So um, some of the very simple structural models at the beginning of the project just take a very simple network of these shapes and, uh, and then test it out structurally. And we realized that we could build something um, ar architectural in scale and still have it be just about the drawings, like so that the project is really exploring how to build structure and space through the expression on the surface of these modules. Um, this was the first instance that we did of the project for the 2008 uh, Biennale. And what we're looking at here is really a way to build connectivity between these scales. and. In, in one way, really scale the hand of the artist so that uh, it can go from the very large to the very small. It's a very simple um, uh, set of rules. Uh, it, it operates off a very um, uh, kind of classic uh, fractal system, but you can also network these components so in a very, uh, very quickly achieve a kind of complexity, but this, Unlike some of the other projects, what we were, what we were really interested in is, was this, this expression. So if the other projects were really exploring kind of assembly geometry, this one was really exploring what, what happens when you take all of these modalities and really uh, make it uh, about expression itself. The other thing that was fascinating about this project for us is that it complicated this idea of scalar invariance. Scalar invariance basically says that um, Relationships stay the same as even when size changes. Basically, that's like a, a, a one way you could describe it. So, uh, so that even as the size of the shape changes, uh, this, the same behavioral attributes exist. Although, when you're building something that let's let's say this is a, a piece of architecture, when you're building architecture, that may be true, but different sizes began to have different roles in the project. So, for instance, the small ones would house speakers, the medium ones would, would house subwoofers, the larger ones, what we call generation twos, would be structural. These were the ones we'd, we would model structurally. 
And then we would have these generation ones, these very large drawings that would begin to frame space and allow for some of the um, uh, video programming. So this is a kind of x-ray view of the project uh, where you can see the array of these speakers. And the speakers would produce uh, these sound rooms. Uh, the University of York um, had this, uh, has an amazing uh, sound department and they built uh, they basically built these sound rooms so that you could control the movement of sound moving through them spatially using this uh, ambisonic uh, sound technique. So uh, essentially the piece became uh, an instrument for musicians and uh, composers and sound artists to play. Um, but what I wanted to show you here tonight uh, is really how it was built. So the different uh, scales from the small units uh, the, for the smallest one was called Gen 4, that was Gen 3. This is Gen 2. Gen 2 you can't really ship uh, efficiently, so you flat pack it and then rebuild it on site. Uh, generation 2 are uh, the more structural uh, um, components of the piece. And on site, um, it becomes uh, a really uh, kind of a fun, um, a fun process of, of putting the things together. And there are these moments like here where you can see the drawings kind of touch perfectly. And that's where this idea of self-assembly really came alive in, in, in the work. The idea of self-assembly, uh, you know, uh, if you talk to a material scientist, is that molecules organize themselves uh, and produce, uh, produce organizations uh, that, um, uh, that, that utilize their own inherent kind of properties. Um, the piece here was interesting because the drawings are not only the, um, the structure of the piece, so gravity literally flowing through them, and the pieces in aggregate don't just make the space, but the drawing also became the, uh, the instruction for how you would put it together. So it's, uh, it's, it's the, the, the drawing in this self-assembly sense uh, really tells you how the piece um, how the piece goes together. Uh, so you can see here they're lifting in some of the larger, these are what we call the generation one um, um, uh, pieces that would really kind of frame the space. Uh, this project was, um, was organized by um, a commissioning arts organization called TBA21, whose program is to really bring art outside of the museum walls. And this first instance, the first large instance of the project was done in Seville. And then it went on to Turkey, and now it's, it's in Vienna. So, and every time it goes somewhere, uh, we reconfigure it. So it's like a different sand pile for every, um, um, for every city that it, it arrives in. Uh, this here is in uh, Eminu Square in Istanbul, Turkey, uh, where it was positioned uh, in between uh, two mosques. And there was a lot of discussion there at the time even the, the mayor of Istanbul made a really uh, amazing comment about how it had this kind of arabesque uh, quality to it uh, and that it's uh, in some of the motifs of the drawings uh, related in a way to, to the context around it. So it's interesting how sometimes when you engage these properties of complexity that it opens up this possibility for, um, for connections that uh, the, that were previously unseen. Uh, let's just move on. So here you can see the, the neighboring mosque. I mean, one idea too that's probably worth um, talking about is this idea of something being, um, being messy. I think all, all the projects I've showed you um, so far, there, there's a kind of roughness to it. There's definitely a kind of frayed edge to all the projects, and that's what we really learned from, from the grotto, which was the first time we really tried that. But this idea that there's not a kind of clean uh, line with, through the piece, and this frayed edge is really important to us because um, it, it, it teaches us that something can be quite messy or can roughly be a space, roughly be a chair, you know, roughly be a wall, um, and it can, it can perform on those functions, but it can also be indeterminate. And that's, that's what's so important about these, um, the way that we engage these projects. To us, it's this idea of, of keeping it indeterminate is so important 
because it's precisely at this frayed edge where other orders might be present, ones that you're not too sure are there yet. So it's a way of basically keeping it, uh, keep it, keeping it open. Um, this, uh, I wonder if I can, is there speakers by any chance? Um, this was one of uh, my own personal uh, favorite uh, performances that was done in the piece. Um, that's Lee Ronaldo, uh, the gu guitarist of uh, Sonic Youth. And he's uh, stringing up a guitar. He hangs it from, uh, from the keystone piece of the, uh, 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 of the morning line. And then he plays the guitar and then bangs it against, uh, <laughs> against the structure itself to produce this kind of feedback. And I thought it was really great. I mean, not just uh, because the piece can be kind of interpreted in all these ways, but I think ultimately what we're trying to do in all our work and in this messiness, at the core of it is we're trying to enter this dynamic of complexity precisely for moments like this, where if you keep it open enough, you know, people will find their own, uh, their own way through it. Maybe just a um, um, little story um, for the last couple of projects here. One thing that we are very, these are some baskets that we, uh, that we made a few years ago. And um, oh, it's okay. Was it me? Uh, the, the baskets were a collab, it's fine, thanks. Um, the baskets were a collaboration with this uh, basket weaver, uh, Tahona Odom. Um, his name is uh, Terrell Du Johnson. He's, uh, he's from the Tahona Odom tribe in Sells, Arizona. And there's some key characters that we've learned a lot from uh, um, and learned a lot about architecture and making things. And what he taught us is that uh, the process of making a basket is really a conversation. Uh, that what you do when you, when you make baskets is you gather around in a circle and, and you talk. And it's that, it's that process of making things that, um, that is really the, uh, the product of, of a basket. So these in particular, um, he called this the conversation baskets, because the baskets to him were literally conversing with each other. And to us, that was a really kind of important, uh, it, was, it was an important idea about the process of design where, um, I mean, you have, let's say, um, when you're designing, you have things that you're dealing with, like geometry uh, and matter, things that are, let's say, of uh, abstract and coded, like computation. Um, and but then, uh, and and they're they're of like, say, universal significance in a way. They can be they can be turned into various languages, uh, into mathematics and so forth. Um, but you also have uh, things like. Uh, very normal things like a basket has to hold something. Um, things in our city, uh, architecture, homes, uh, there's a kind of germane quality to it. And these baskets, to us, like we started to realize, like, well, maybe design is about, it is a conversation. It is a conversation between things of universal significance and things that manifest that universal significance, things like baskets. Um, I'm not going to talk about this project. I'm going to move on to this is the last project I want to show you um, because it, it's, uh, uh, it's important to us and it's important when we, uh, when we do these, uh, all of these projects that every once in a while we, um, sorry, let me go back that we produce these uh, experiments that allow us to really engage uh, complexity and really get inside of these dynamics. Um, this here is um, it's a billboard. It's the largest uh, video billboard in, in the country. Uh, it stands on top of Fresh Direct. Uh, it faces the Long Island uh, Expressway into New York City. And there's a couple of interesting properties about this billboard. Um, this is a standard size billboard this little rectangle here, and this is a jumbo billboard here. And so when uh, Fresh Direct built this on top of their factory, uh, the New York City Building Department said, well, that's the last time that happens. And they passed a, they passed a zoning ordinance that would prevent any, any billboard larger than a jumbo from going up. So this billboard now exists as a, 
as, a, uh, as an anomaly uh, in the city. And so we went to Fresh Direct and we asked them if we could use their billboard. And they, um, they said yes. And we, we bought advertising time uh, at night. And what we did is we, uh, uh, and we made a film. This is a three channel video installation that we did um, a few years ago. And what's amazing about the billboard is its effect on the city around it. Uh, it literally lights up, I'd say, a good half mile at night. It illuminates the, the city. And what we, um, what we did is we produced uh, basically um, an engine into the video billboard that would take the brightest colors and then introduce their complement. So it was, a, it was a kind of dance around the color wheel. Uh, and so we, would, we were able to get the kind of deepest blues and the deepest reds or magentas and the brightest yellows and greens out of this engine. And we just simply documented that at night so that we were able to produce this transformation on the city, very subtle. Um, well, actually, it wasn't that subtle. Uh, but it, it just wasn't, uh, we weren't using the media, uh, the advertising media, for maybe what it was, uh, what it was generated for. But for, for us, it was really important to, and this is a movie, and this is a long uh, movie, but I'll just, uh, just kind of scroll through it. Um, Let me go. I mean, for maybe the, the lesson and kind of what I want to leave you with um, tonight is that while we do uh, build things, sometimes uh, when, you're, when you're entering uh, the dynamics of complexity, uh, sometimes the most important thing is just to get inside of it. And that's like, a, that's like an ethic that we, that we have in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the practice. And sometimes when you get inside of it, you realize that in these dynamics, um, sometimes synthesis is more powerful than making something new. And that's what we garnered from, from the Fresh Direct project, from this video project, and just taking on this issue of color, is that when you, uh, when you, when you feed these, um, these systems or these procedures back out into the city, you get new properties uh, surprising overlaps, new relationships, and that's enough, or that's enough newness that you can call uh, a project. So that is, yes, that's my last slide. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, how about this? Mm. Ben, two questions. I'm not sure if I should do the kind question first or the mean <laughs> one. <laughs> so, uh, give me the um, well, the first thing I want to say is that uh, lovely lecture. I enjoyed it very much. As you know, I know your work, and I've even had you explain it to me. You gave me my first Skype experience in my life, if you remember, some yeah. years ago. <laughs> and I was really impressed by that. Now, um, <laughs> no, it was astounding, really. It was. Uh, and. Uh, my question to you is simply this. I've written about your work, as you know, uh, more than once. And um, I noticed you didn't use the word algorithm once in your presentation, nor did you explain any of the magic. Yeah. What's, what, what's that all about? You know, there's, uh, there's been something curious that's happened in architecture in the past, um, like, 10 years, five years, maybe. Um, and I think we, uh, we have an attitude about this kind of algorithmic approach that's, um, that's basically we don't think it's particularly meaningful. There's nothing inherently transcendental about algorithms. Uh, there's nothing, um, there's nothing meaningful within them themselves. Rather, what we try to do in our work 
is travel with them, is use them to get somewhere, to inspire us. So the, the mechanics of them are, are, are vital, right? They're vital in that journey. In that journey. Um, but, but that's not the entire, um, that's not the entire project. I mean, this, this idea of taking on like indeterminacy uh, means that anything can be, uh, can be a driver. And the, I mean, I think, you know, I've, I've had this discussion too. I mean, this is a long answer, I realize, but I've had this discussion too with, you can also describe it as a difference between like strong uh, artificial intelligence or weak artificial intelligence, like strong AI or weak AI. It's a kind of debate um, in, the, in the sciences where um, some people would say that an algorithm um, that, say, simulates flocking behavior like is a kind of life form, that it, that it actually is life. Um, and where a weak artificial intelligence position would say, that it's 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 a model, and it's that it's that it's that it's that difference between one or the other that I think you have to kind of stake your claim and decide where you're at. I mean, we we definitely find it to be uh, provisional that these systems are are provisional at best. I just want to say that you owe me big time for asking that question because that was a beautiful answer. <laughs> oh, but a very important answer as well. Um, I never heard you say that. Um, so, do we go back a little bit to some pedestrian general questions that <laughs> would have preceded your answer? Um, a lot of people who play around with uh, these kind of generative models, a lot of people like continuous forms, and a lot of people like discrete forms, and a lot of people also do a little bit of both. You seem stick to the discrete. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about it today, why, why that is? I would, yeah, it's definitely a tendency. And I mean, the dis I think, I mean, I talked about it a little bit in the, in the lecture, but maybe it's worth going back, um, understanding this, this idea of like messiness or the kind of ragged edge. Um, it's, it's just a, it, it seems like a way to keep the door kind of open. Um, keep 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 it a little ajar that there might be something new on the horizon there that we might not know yet, and or there's something in the project itself, like the the idea of a kind of complete, let's say, continuous um, um, hermetic uh, assembly is something that we haven't uh, we haven't uh, explored because precisely because we're interested in all of these systems. Uh, remaining open and remaining reconfigurable. I mean, there's a, there's a real, um, there's a kind of underlying uh, property of, of recuperation and reconfiguration in all of these projects that I want to believe is not just a kind of um, stylistic preference, but is a way of, of, of looking forward, a way of understanding everything that you do um, as a, as as a as having a kind of future life, a, a kind of recycling, if you will. Hey. Yeah. Um, just to follow up on what what you answered before, is there something transcendental about geometry? And is there a do the solids that you choose carry some kind of meaning? Uh, and the third kind of, to follow up on that, in relation to scale, what does determine the scale of the different pieces? I don't think there's, no, I, I, I really, I mean, there's nothing I can preach. <laughs> you know, there's nothing like, like Inherently meaningful about um, about a, a you know a block of wood. It's um, uh, I mean what what I, I I mean maybe the uh, the best way to describe it is that um, um, what is the best way to describe it? 
can I go to your second question? What's the, what was the, uh, what was the second question? It was also about meaning. Yes, no, the three questions again, if there is something okay. transcendental about geometry, right, um, in general, and then if the specific solids that you choose to use uh, carry a certain meaning, because, you know, in, in history, uh, there were different meanings assigned to different forms, uh, shapes, geometry, solids, etc. And the third is, uh, it has to do with scale or dimensions, let's say. What determines the size of the units you choose to work with? I mean, if, if there's something transcendental, um, someone needs to tell me. Because <laughs> uh, I'm, um, I'm not seeing it. Um, but, uh, but I can certainly respect all the narratives of, of, of transcendental things that surround uh, mathematics and geometry. Certainly the, you know, the example of the, of the mosque in Iran, I think is a beautiful kind of connection between uh, a mathematical model of, of infinity, which was that aperiodic kind of tiling, and, and what that might mean in a kind of spiritual sense. So, um, but uh, for us, like the, the reason we're interested like in that, in these shapes, uh, and especially the shapes that produce this kind of endlessness, is that um, uh, I think like human beings are just really good at, at, at perceiving pattern. And, and I, I, I wanna believe that the ability of the human eye to focus and perceive uh, order like is an, is an evolutionary uh, property. It's a, it's a habit we have. And, um, but to, to have this position where you're, where you're pushing vision just beyond that faculty of recognition, like just beyond, like that's that ragged edge. Like that's a, that to me is how design becomes a kind of vital exercise in this, let's say, evolutionary uh, kind of field. And then uh, that, that's, that's where these kind of properties of invention might, might lie. That's where design can, can, can maybe be inventive. Just to follow, <coughs> just to follow up, um, in material science, uh, when they produce a model, they talk about the closed system or the artificial life models, the constraints of the, of the existence are embedded in the model. But in design, or the way you use the algorithm in design, it's, it's, it's very interesting. And my question is, do you work within an open system? I mean, do you interact with your algorithm? Do you, do you di redirect your algorithm? Do you invent your constraints? Because it's not a f an, an artificial model which works with, you know, with processes of, of life, but you invent many, um, many conditions to, in order to be able to design. So how do you do that? I mean, I want to believe that you basically do it because you've, uh, you internalize it. I mean, one of the important reasons that we engage computation and we, um, you know, we try and write our own tools and um, try and get, get really deep into it is so that so that you're internalizing it and you're becoming, you know, it's becoming part of you and you're becoming part of it. So that at some moment, your intuition can, can become a, a factor and a driver. And I wanna be, I wanna believe, like the reason we do projects like, like this one, or, you know, we did this project with the birds that I didn't show tonight, but, um, I mean, it's, this is all about getting inside of a dynamic. It's about, in this case, maybe getting inside of an RGB space. Uh, and it's an important, like, th that idea of getting inside of something and becoming part of it using your intuition, uh, all of that are, all of that is an important um, way to, to be a designer, I think, because ultimately what we're looking for is, is a way to have our own voice. Another question. Um, does the Nobel Prize, what, what, what achievement of the Nobel Prize of Danny Schechtman 
Hey, Shekman. Yeah. Shekman. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's a good friend of mine. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, how does it impact your work? Um, uh, well, uh, Shekman had, writ had written a, um, a way that you can, um, you can, you can, uh, you can port some of these uh, quasi-crystalline uh, assemblies into a language that we knew how to use. So we basically, uh, we, we owe him because we kind of ripped him off and brought, brought, his, uh, brought his algorithms into a kind of architectural Very happy space. About it. He's happy about it? Yes. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, you know, uh, he, he basically came up with a, um, with a way that it could, that it could, uh, uh, that it could be parsed into a, another language, and, and that language eventually we were able to bring into our, you know, the software that we use. So, um, he was a, you know, he was, he was a big step for us. That's great. That's really great to hear. That's like, I'm really humbled <laughs> right now. Cool. All right. That was great. Thank you. Uh, it's good. Yeah, despite the uh,